I mean, the, the plan for the two remaining benches is something like this, that I really want to get to multiple vortex fields, but as I want to do them uh, quantitatively, and I'll have a lot of troubles doing them quantitatively at once, I want to go through doing them indirectly, measuring them indirectly. And in order to do that, I have to talk about circularly polarized Gaussian beam and how that can be transferred, how the transfer of that type of beam can be uh, measured very precisely in optical users. And after that, I'll show you a little bit of applications of it. And after that, I'll go to orbital angular which means the vortex beams, and how we can measure transfer of orbital angular momentum. So as we started yesterday, at the very last part of my lecture, talking about optical angular momentum in, in the spin form. So we have circularly polarized light. So our electric field vector is describing the circle. And um, uh, as I said yesterday, there, there has been a lot of interest throughout the history about measuring uh, transfer of uh, spin angular momentum or auto angular momentum. And as I said to you, this uh, experiment of Beth uh, dates from 1936. And basically, we have a, a torsion pendulum and a circularly polarized light, and we are trying to transfer 4 h bar per photon. Uh, so this was the first, very first measurement of the momentum of light. I should also add that throughout history, uh, there has been a lot of interest in measurement of radiation pressure force of light. Um, and again, it dates from the beginning of 20th century, uh, how has measured um, um, the, the, the reflection or the, the change in momentum when um, uh, light was coming towards a um, um, absorbing surface. But all those measurements were very difficult. And although in Beck's experiment he actually did, uh, was able to show momentum transfer, it was very difficult to put numbers to it. So it's a tricky experiment because the momentum transfer I mean, 4 h bar ain't much. So to measure it, you need pretty good methods. So, so uh, you can do it microscopically, and this is what is done uh, in, in this uh, overhead. So basically, I have a crystal which happens to be bifringent. And we talked about it yesterday, that bifringent crystal means that I have two indices of refraction, um, extraordinary and ordinary index of refraction. and uh, the sort of um, uh, biofringence is uh, determined by the difference between these two indices. And the bigger the difference in those two indices, the easier it is to build that over from that front. But in order to do that, you need to have a special, uh, a given uh, uh, thickness of the plane, which is lambda over 4. Okay, so what happens in this experiment, mi mi microscopic experiment of measurement of spin angular momentum, is that I have circularly polarized light, I'm going into my microscope, I have bifringent particle, particle then <coughs> acts as lambda of a four plate, so it starts rotating in opposite sense to the, to the, um, uh, to the circular polarized light, and so we are exerting optical torque on it. And of course, this is happening in the environment, in the liquid environment. So we have dry torque um, acting on it. Okay. And so what will happen is that these crystals will then rotate continuously or align to a particular orientation, depending on their thickness and the size. In linearly polarized light, so I can have linearly polarized light here as well because I can put lambda over two plate or just directly laser light, which normally is linearly polarized, they will orient themselves in a controllable way. Okay? And if I have elliptically polarized light, they will rotate with frequency, and that frequency of rotation can be controlled. So if I can measure rotation uh, and state of the polarization of light transmitting through such a crystal, then I can do my measurements of, of, of transfer of spin angular momentum in a very precise way. So how does this all happen? It's, it's rather simple. So we are looking what happens when elliptically polarized light is incident on bar fringing crystal material. And we can express 
the electrical field vector, the amplitude of the vector, and with this expression here, and this is the geometry of the situation that I'm describing in this equation. And so this incoming wave is passing through the material which is bar stringent, so it has extraordinary and ordinary refractive index. The light is then shifted in phase and depending by uh, a wavelength of light divided by two pi, so k vector, uh, and uh, thickness of the plate and the refractive index of the medium. Uh, so the imagined light then can be expressed in this way. So what happens here is that I get a phase shift uh, depending on, uh, depending on the, uh, uh, how thick the plate is and what the refractive indices are. Okay? So that's what's happening. And so if I now look uh, for a plane wave, what is the total angular momentum of the field? This will be given by this expression here. So that the angular momentum density of the field before can be defined and after passing through the material can also be defined. And as we can see, this angular momentum density is given by this formula here. It's proportional to the uh, e squared sine to, to phi, uh, phi, and then on the uh, passing through the material, again, we have this difference between the refractive indices and, and the thickness of the plate to take into account. So depending on those values of these parameters here, we will get a varying uh, amount of uh, uh, angular momentum density on the, in the outer calendar. Okay. So if we look at that a little bit more in detail, then we can uh, look at the change in the angular momentum of the light resulting, which will give us torque per unit area. Uh, and this will be given by this uh, formula here. And we can see that what's interesting in it is that this first part uh, will give me alignment torque. And the second part will give me rotational term. So if uh, I can play with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, angles here, and I can either have alignment or I can either have rotation or I can have both. So, so, so playing with that will give me uh, quite a flexibility of, uh, of looking at what happens on the transmission of light when it's uh, fully polarized. So what we see here is very bad film of a calcite crystal, which is very flat. Uh, and the light is going through the calcite crystal, and I'm changing the position of lambda over two plate uh, continuously over 360 degrees. And as I'm changing it, the uh, crystal is following uh, the uh, direction of my polarization. So this is linearly polarized light. So if I have linearly polarized light, no circle electrical component in it, by changing the direction of the linearly <coughs> polarized light, I can rotate an object. So this is an evidence of having transferred uh, linearly, linear momentum to the uh, plate. But I can also have a circularly polarized light, or maybe a slightly elliptically polarized light. Again, this is calcite crystal. Unfortunately, this is quite big calcite crystal, so that it's heavy and it's sort of touching the microscope's light. But you can see that it can continuously rotate. And again, I can measure that rotation in my camera or whatever, and uh, then determine the torque, possibly. And we'll look at that. So what can we do with it? We can play games building optically driven micro machines, which can be orders of magnitude smaller than the actual actuators in MEMS are today. So they can be, these machines here are about <coughs> five microns across, so they are rather small. And the big thing about it is that what we want to do is to drive these machines and then build several machines in a row using this uh, transfer of uh, spin angular momentum. So basic idea is something like this. I take my optical tweezers beam, which is circularly polarized. I spin a, a, a crystal, which is bar fringent crystal, calcium carbonate crystal, and I bring it close to the machine, and uh, I create a flow, of course, around this 
uh, a, a rotating crystal, and so the flow will drive the uh, rotation of the machine. Okay, so let us do this. So this is the flow around the machine. Okay, so I brought my tweezers very close to the cog, which is free to move. So obviously the cog is moving with the flow uh, around the rotating crystal, and this cog um, uh, sort of stops and starts because of the cogs in it. Okay, and then you can uh, 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 pin it down a bit. So what we're doing in this part is that I have optical tweezers. Uh, which is tracking the rotating crystal, and, uh, and I have optical tweezers which are preventing this uh, cog to move away in the flow, and then I rotate this crystal, and so it rotates the other cog. And then you can have a machine which you get when you're not doing experiment very cleverly. So what happened here is that during the experiment there was a crystal which came and uh, situated itself in the tweezers with the cog, and we are trying actually to shake it away. But what shake it away and, and free it from, and you see that we used a lot of power because we burned part of the crystal, but what it shows is that you can have uh, on one axis two machines, and you drive one machine and the other machine follows. So this is an example of sort of togetherness in the machine sets. Okay, so um, as I said, what, what it is all about is to have a, 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 a crystal which is bar fringing, which you can rotate in optical tweezers. So now the question is, how, the, how do we get this crystal? But before I, I mention that, so I'll just summarize what we are trying to do here. So I have circularly polarized light. Now it should go like this, okay. Circularly polarized light, which is coming onto lambda over four plane. If it's perfect lambda over four plane, I will get linearly polarized light out. So zero angular momentum, the spin momentum per photon. And because I'm transferring this spin angular momentum to this plate, if it's a free plate, uh, well, it will rotate uh, 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 so because we have to preserve the momentum. Okay, so in order to do all that, what I need is this bar fringing crystal. So the experiments that I was showing you uh, before about the optically driven micro machines, what we basically did in early days was we crashed calcite crystal and then uh, we put it uh, into the solution and mixed it with our machines and tracked the crystals and they were rotated. However, those crystals have not very controlled geometry and of course calculations, as I'll show you in a minute, are much easier done on perfectly spherical crystals. So the aim was here to produce spherical crystals instead of having crystals like this, even if perfect, um, we wanted spherical crystals, uh, which still would be half rigid. So this is an actual crystal that we have, uh, and uh, uh, so this is spherical <coughs> calcium carbonate crystal, which is called batterite, I told you yesterday. And this is, so this is how it's seen in uh, optical microscope. You can't see much of its structure because of the resolution. But if you go into scanning electron microscope, you can see that it looks a little bit like a perfectly round cauliflower. So the surface is a little bit bumpy, but those bumps you can see are on the order of nanometers. And overall, it sort of looks very uh, spherical. Then it is calcium carbonate. We have checked by doing an XRD uh, uh, spectroscopy on it. And indeed, uh, it is calcium carbonate of a particular structure. So how come that it can be spherical? Because if you think of it, it is rather a large crystal. It's microns in size. And the single crystal is um, orders of magnitude smaller. So somehow those crystals, while we are producing our calcite, come together to produce almost spherical uh, uh, objects. And there is a lot of discussion about the structure, how it comes that the structure can be that round. But basic, uh, the, the one of the models which is prevalent in the literature is that 
these little crystals of calcium carbonate, when they are in the solution, uh, they sort of align themselves like sheet of wheat here. And so the optics axis is along this direction. Um, and somehow overall, there is a lot of space in between those little crystals, but overall, they are rather bad friendship. So you're thinking about it as a kind of tree-like Yes, yes, yes. And so here are examples of how they crystallize. So this is our um, stuff. So we are really only interested in, in spherical crystals, but you can see that you can have quite um, interesting structures produced in, uh, in uh, uh, that solution, in solutions. And here you can see that um, most of the time when you produce these crystals, what happens is that you will get a mixture of calcium, and the calcium, this is typical calcium structure, a crystal structure, and again, they sort of pile up and maintain that structure, and then we have butterflies, which are pretty round and different sizes. Okay, so this is our fringin, and in order to look at the fringin, what we have done is that we have looked at, let's see whether it works, and you can see it. So this is a, a biofringin crystal which is being trapped, I put it between two cross polarizers and I rotate it. And there's a lot of literature which shows that um, you can characterize biofringins by looking at the rotation uh, patterns of a biofringin uh, crystal. And so this, this is, these are the, uh, you, you can see that depending on polarization direction, we can get all those patterns happening. And if we characterize those, we should be able to uh, calculate the refractive indices, the uh, bifringence of the crystal. So what we have done here is we have modeled it, and this is a um, right rotating between two cross polarizers, as I said, and what is different here is that we have different diameter of these particles, and if I start it up, uh, I'm rotating the particle, and you can see how the pattern is rotating, and by Characterizing this pattern, we can characterize our crystal. Then I'll just start it up. So the so so the, the patterns are heavily dependent upon the size of the particle. But as I said, we can measure the size of the particle quite carefully, and then we can see how well our models describe. Okay. So if we now believe that we have the spherical particles that I wanted to have, and that they are really bad fringing, which I'll show you in a minute as well. Uh, because we have measured that those biofringent particles, which are perfectly spherical, uh, maintain their biofringents up to 60 to 80 percent as compared to the single crystal. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, in order to quantitatively measure spin angular momentum on the transfer or transfer of spin angular momentum, I have certainly polarized light. I have my spherical particle, therefore, all the calculations will be very simple. And the particle then will be set into rotation if it acts as lambda on the fog plate. And then what will happen is that uh, some of the uh, spin angular momentum will be transferred, of course, to this particle. So on the outcome, if I collect all this light in the transmitted light, what will happen is that the polarization state of that light will be changed. And measuring change in polarization is rather simple game. At the same time, this thing rotates in the liquid, so therefore uh, we will get torque acting on this particle. So I have optically created a torque, I have applied it to my particle, and that torque can be easily calculated because it's just dependent upon change in polarization between incoming light and outgoing light and laser power, which is P, divided by optical frequency of the light. Viscous drag acting, so I have uh, the, the, the uh, 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 viscous drag, uh, torque, which is proportional to the viscosity of the liquid in which I am rotating the particle times uh, radius of the particle to the third. Um, and this is very sensitive, as you can see, if I don't know the size of my particle very well, um, all my measurements uh, will not be that precise. So, but uh, knowing particle size, therefore, is very important. 
Another thing that I have to know is how fast the project is. So, um, and if I know all this, then I know that this uh, drag torque will be equal to the optically applied torque, and from making these sides of the two equations equal, I can calculate viscosity of the surrounding liquid. So, in other words, I can use this method, method for measurement, very precise measurement, of micro viscosity. Okay, in very tight environment. Okay, so how do I do that? Practically, what we do is that we have our optical tweezers here. I track my biofringent particle, so it's a circularly polarized light on the biofringent particle. The light is being transmitted. Uh, I can look in the camera, just like I was showing you in the first lecture. I can... Wow. I can look in the camera how the particle is rotating, but I can take this transmitted light and play a little bit with it. Namely, I can put it onto almost perfectly reflecting mirror, which will leak tiny, tiny, tiny bit of light through, and I put this part onto the photo detector. And of course, if the particle is rotating here, this photo detector signal will show me the rotation rate. Now, I put lambda with four plate here again. I divide the light into either two orthogonal polarizations or two uh, circular polarizations, left-handed and right-handed. Then I have two detectors, and I measure the polarization state, therefore, of the light which has been transmitted through the particle. Okay? So this is the, I know the state of polarization here. It's perfectly circularly polarized, we say. And then I look at the change in polarization. And this is what I get. So this is, these are actually real experimental curves. So this is a response from this detector. So I can see the rotation of the particle. You can see that the signal is pretty clean. And then I have left circularly polarized component, which is that one, and right circularly polarized, polarized component, which is this one from those two detectors. And the difference between them, so assuming that the, the polarization was, we had one H bar per photon, now you can see the change in polarization. So that gives me my delta sigma in my uh, uh, previous formula, and therefore I can calculate the total after launch. Assuming that I know the size and power of the incoming laser. So there were a few things that I assumed here, so I just summarize a little bit here. So this is my signal here. I have my detectors and I look at the, and the light is coming in. Sorry, the light is coming in, circularly polarized. Particle is rotating. I put it into polarizer. I, I look at the signals. But this assumes, all that assumes that I am able to measure, firstly, uh, uh, power of the laser in the focal spot. And that I also am able to collect all the light which is coming through in transmitted light to verify what sort of power is left there and also to verify the amount of polarization change. So we were able to do it, of course, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Uh, okay, so this is a little bit difficult to see. This is dark stuff. So this is almost spherical particle. If it would be perfectly spherical, we wouldn't see anything. Uh, as far as particle is concerned, we would see the flow around it. But this particle is rotating in the water. So the experiments have verified that you can measure the viscosity of water within 3%. So we sort of know what we are doing. But in order to convince ourselves that we really have a method which is a little bit more general than just using water, uh, what we have done is to measure the uh, viscosity of glycerol. Why do glycerol often people ask? Because uh, the values for glycerol at different concentrations are well known uh, uh, values and therefore easy to, uh, to compare with the experiments. And you can see that our experimental data is uh, agreeing very well with accepted glycerol viscosity. Now, somebody the last time I showed this slide asked me why accepted glycerol viscosity. Well, because there is still a little bit of an assumption made here, and it is that my particle does not change temperature. Okay, because temperature is incredibly sensitive. The viscosity is incredibly sensitive to temperature. 
So you can see that ever bars have become a little bit big there, but anyway, it still agrees uh, uh, quite well. So I told you uh, uh, before when I was talking about the Vatrite crystal that it is a quite curious beast, namely that it maintains its um, biofungins very well. Uh, it, it very well uh, where are we here? Uh, uh, even though it is uh, hugely bigger, orders of magnitude bigger than the single crystal. And so to convince ourselves about it and the readers of our papers as well, we actually measured how biofringent uh, our vitalite crystals are. So uh, a single crystal has difference in refractive index of in refractive indices, extraordinary and ordinary refractive index of O1. Uh, fibers, as measured by Dolly, is about 0.09. Sterilite 0.06, and ours is 0.06. The fifth piece. So it's 60% in this measurement. So it's pretty impressive for material science people to actually see uh, this big by fringes in colloidal particles. But that was just uh, a side note. So here I have my uh, vaterite particle, which is rotating in water, and this is another vaterite particle which happened to be close by, and you have seen it in my very first slide of my lectures. So this vaterite eventually will be drawn into other machine and, and we have a connected machine of no use to anybody. But it looks nice. Okay, but if you want to use it for something, you can start constructing uh, 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 flows, uh, directions of flows. So what we do here is basically we have two vaterite particles which are rotating in the opposite sense. So circularly polarized, left-handed, right-handed. And then this particle is quite far away and it was drawn to the, towards the, the rotating particles. And you can then imagine that you can put a row of such particles in holographic tweezers, and then you will be able to drive the flow, microflow, through a, a channel built that way. Okay, so there is work done by Miles Budget Group where they have put these butt-like particles of ours into a channel, microfluidic channel, and they have uh, put a dye into the liquid, and you can see that you can measure the, the, uh, the direction of the uh, liquid while the particles are rotating. So it's exactly that experiment I showed you before. So they are rotated in opposite sets. And that all is to lead to lab and the chip situation. Okay, so there, there, there has been a number of very interesting uh, papers uh, recently where this, the rotation of the particles was used for different things. So here, this is um, a work from uh, Michael Schiff's group from Sweden, where they are rotating spherical gold nanoparticles. Those gold nanoparticles are much smaller than those I was showing you before. These are only of the order of 100 to 400 nanometers in size. They are illuminating them with circularly polarized light. The particles are slightly absorptive, about 10% absorption occurs in those particles, so they heat up, but they absorb the spin angular momentum and they rotate. And they rotate very, very fast. Okay, so he was able to rotate, and his lab was able to rotate into um, uh, mega -hands. Now, uh, and, and this is the evidence of it, so they use slightly different method to what I was showing you, they use the autocorrelation signal. You see that there's huge difference, nothing happens when I have linearly polarized light, and then when I have circularly polarized light, autocoloration function looks like the blue one, and the part is not fast. Okay, so, and, and what is interesting in this work, what is curious in this work, is that how, if, you, if you do um, back of an envelope calculations uh, of uh, you put the speed of rotation into it with a certain power of the laser, 
it suggests that the temperature around this particle is incredibly high. So the question is whether it is so that it is creating a micro bubble and the uh, gold nanoparticle is actually rotating in, in, uh, in the gas or, or vacuum or something of the sort. <laughs> or whether it's really surrounded by water and, and, and the rotation can take place. So these are unanswered questions and the people are working on that. Um, also, uh, another um, thing has been done with these rotating particles and it was uh, a group of um, Kishan Dolakia with collaboration with Microsoft who have used these rotating particles uh, in a measurement of uh, viscosity of different gases. Uh, so, uh, for those of you who do not do optical tweezers, and there were only two hands which came up when I asked how many of you have done it, it is namely so that if you if you trap things in water, life is simple. If you try to trap things in vacuum, life is becoming very difficult. So, <clears throat> if you try to trap uh, do trapping in, in gases, it might is it much much more difficult than doing. And you can maybe guess why. Any idea? Yes. Buoyancy. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so it, it's much more difficult to, and, and, and of course viscosity comes in as well. So it is much more difficult. But it's doable, okay? So you can do it. And you can rotate them, and from the rotation rate, just as I was showing you before, knowing this change in polarization state in the transmitted light, etc., you can then uh, look at the viscosity of the different gases. More recently, uh, uh, Kishan's group has done another very nice experiment, which is very, very difficult to do. Um, and I won't go into details uh, hugely, but I just want to impress you with the rotation rate that he got for his particle in vacuum. Now you would say, so what's this drive to get higher and higher rotation? It's nothing interesting that they say. But uh, if you trap things in vacuum, what you can actually, and rotate them, you can actually look at um, onset or the borderline between classical and quantum physics. So you can you can see whether you can uh, cool the system to its um, quantum ground state and see what happens then and look at um, quantum um, uh, effects in systems like that. So basically what this whole thing describes here is that we have trapping of particle now which is butterized particle still uh, which is trapped uh, originally in gas and then the gas is evacuated from the chamber and uh, if they maintain the particle trap, they cool it a certain amount and they can see uh, frequency of rotations and frequency of uh, um, rotational fre frequencies which have to do with overtones and so on and so forth. And uh, they are not in the quantum ground state yet, but um, quantum friction, for example, is the thing that people would like to study in the system. Um, so, another example of what can be done with rotating particles, uh, this time in biology rather than uh, in other systems, is that um, we looked with a group of uh, Michael Burns uh, at um, probing uh, mechanotransduction in cells when the cells are exposed to stress. So they can be exposed to linear stress by moving particles in and out, and that has been published in um, uh, Nature earlier than this work here. And basically what, what they were able to do is that the particle is trapped in normal trap, uh, linear trap if you, if you wish, and it's uh, nudging the cell with, uh, with known force, and then we use FRET and other uh, fancy uh, fluorescence measurements to see how the signal is transducted through the cell while the stress is being applied. But there has been also a lot of discussion about rotating uh, particles, uh, well, applying shear stress 
to the, to the cells and see how they react to shear stress. And the best way of, 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 of applying shear stress is to rotate something around with, very close to them and then see how the particle rotates. So this one was supposed to be around this particle. Anyway, uh, so this is calcium, calcium carbonate particle, the spherical one, and I trap it and I change the polarization angle to get a, a, a certainly polarized light. And then I create uh, a flow around this particle and I observe what happens to the cell. And I will now put the film on, but if you want to be able to see it, the result is here actually. So if I start it, this is the position of the cell here. If I start the, the flow around it, the cell is retracting itself. So it's a living cell, so it's retracting itself from the stress exerted on it. And of course, we can measure how much stress we apply. And then through looking at it, you can see that the signal within the cell, the threat signal within the cell is changing dramatically. And by analyzing the signal, uh, you can analyze the mechanotransduction of the cell. So let me see whether I can do it. Uh, I don't know how much you can see, nothing. Uh, so there, there was a little bit of glimpses, it doesn't matter, a little bit of glimpses of what's happening. So as I said, what happens, I can try to start it again. Yes. So the, you can see that the cell uh, retracts very rapidly from the, from the stress exerted on it. And as I said, what, what's really nice about this method being used in biology is that it makes the measurements quantitative. So you can quantify the force which has been exerted at a certain situation in the cell. Okay, and also what we have done uh, recently with Michael Burns group is to look at the photon-driven micromotors which were uh, nerve fiber growing cells. Okay, so we have axons here and the axons are on the microscope slide and I, so here are the axons of the uh, neuronal cell, and uh, we put batterites around uh, the axon, and uh, we spin the batterite, and we look at the direction at which the axons are moving. Do they follow the flow? And if we change the direction of my rotating particle, will they change uh, uh, direction as well? And here is the result. So they basically follow the flow uh, direction. So they grow all the time uh, follow and which, uh, what direction uh, the particle is rotating. And then of course you can play with the two particles, this was what I was showing you in color, and so then if they're rotating in opposite sense and the neuron is coming towards, the axon is coming towards it, it will follow uh, 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 straight on. Just like the liquid was doing when I was rotating two particles in opposite sense. So it's pretty curious, but we're still working on it. I can't tell you many more results of that. So what do we want to really do with this uh, part of, of the project we have? We want to put our rotating batterite particles into real cells, and then probe the cell environment within the cell at very, very, very minute details. And so the first step of it is to create giant unilamula vesicles put the particles, so these are the uninamula vesicles, we want to put the particle into such vesicle and then measure the rotation rate inside the particle and, um, and viscosity of, of the insides of the cell. And is it doable? Yes, it has been shown, so there's a lot of discussion about what happens if you push any uh, uh, particle into a cell uh, does the membrane go around the cell or does it uh, break up and the particle is freely in the cell? There's a lot of discussion about that and not many answers. But what was shown in this work of uh, Robert's group is that they had giant humidamola vesicle. They had this time, it's just a normal particle, uh, uh, latex bead, which is pushed with optical tweezers through the membrane into the cell. And this is the process as it is happening in, in, uh, in time, so eventually the particle is in the cell. Whether it's surrounded by the membrane uh, or not is another story, but using optical tweezers again, you can see 
that as soon as the particle goes into the cell, you can see very large change in, in displacement and therefore measuring displacements very carefully as I was showing you before is, uh, is something that can give us a lot of very nice results. Okay, so um, last but not least, uh, what we are doing with this rotating crystals is microreology. And I already showed you measurement of viscosity, but very often liquids that we want to study are viscoelastic and not viscous. So you want to have a method with which you would be able to measure viscoelasticity of the cell, or, or, or of, of the environment. So this is a very simple model of viscoelasticity here. So I have Newtonian fluid, I have purely viscous part of it, and I have cooking solid purely elastic part of it, and I have them together, I have my Maxwellian fluid viscoelasticity. And I can then calculate complex shear modulus, and it will be given by this equation here. So I'll have storage modulus, which is elasticity, which will be in phase with my cell, and I have loss modulus, which is viscosity, which is out of phase 90 degrees. And so if I have means of measurement of G prime and G double prime, I can determine the viscoelasticity of my liquid. So how do I do it in practice? Again, this is the, uh, the batterite crystal, which is rotated, or uh, uh, I can simply just trap it, uh, and look at the rotational grounding motion of it. So in order to do that, what I can do is this uh, blue is really red laser, uh, infrared laser, and this dark brown is red laser, so I trap with infrared laser my rotating particle, and then I keep it in the trap uh, and look at the rotational grounding motion by looking at the deflection that is caused in this uh, Heaney laser. Uh, so, Hinu laser can be circularly polarized, uh, and then we can look at the same method that we were using before, and we can analyze what's happening with the particle. As I said, we have two methods. One is just to track the particle, rotate it, and look at the rotational ground in motion, so that's the result of that. Or, I can also take my particle and change its position in the trap <coughs> with no angle. And then by doing that, by sort of wiggling particle back and forth, uh, set a, a known angle, I can also determine G and G prime. So this is wiggling of the particle. This is, uh, we are doing it at 45 degrees, so I'm changing with acousto-optic modulator the, the, the angle of the uh, particle by known amount. Okay, and then we can measure it all, and so these are results of measurement which show um, uh, 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 passive measurements. So here I'm measuring down in motion. Here I am measuring the displacement of the particle when, when it is displaced at certain angle. And uh, the, the result to take home from it is that uh, uh, we are varying the, the concentration of a viscoelastic fluid, fluid which is semi-vis. Vis and we can see that the uh, experiment and the theory and macroscopic measurement of, of uh, viscosity agree very well with each other. So this gives us evidence that we can use this method for measurements of viscoelasticity in uh, um, other liquids. Okay, so uh, that was spin. So spin is easy. I can measure it. Uh, uh, quantitatively very easily what the transfer is uh, and I can measure it in all fancy situations. So now can I also do the same with orbital angular momentum? So how we said before how we create orbital angular momentum beams and it is that I take my laser, I put it through a hologram, it could be a static hologram as it is on this picture or it could be SLM or it can be uh, a wave plate um, uh, liquid crystal wave plate and, uh, and so on, so we can produce them in many different ways and depending on the pattern that we imprint on them will then produce in the transmitted or reflected light uh, uh, for, for that matter will create Gauss-Laguerre beams of light. 
So this particular fork is showing that what I'm trying to produce here is Gauss Clavier 0, 3. How do I know that? I look at the number of, of discontinuities here and that will give me the charge of the Gauss Clavier beam of light. So, and all the experiments then are easily done by just putting the thing into the uh, microscope uh, um, uh, objective, a high numerical aperture a microscope objective, and then either looking at reflective light or transmitted light. Now the question is, so how does this look? So this is work from um, David's Greer group. What they have done here is that they have two, two gauss lagier beams of light. This is plus 60, if I remember correctly, it says that, but I can't read it. Plus 60 and minus 40 or something of the sort. An interesting thing to notice here is what I said in one of the previous lectures is that as the charge of the gauss lagier beam goes up, the ring grows in size. Okay? And remember, this is minus uh, plus 60 or whatever, and this is minus 40 or whatever. So they different sides, uh, different sides. What it means is that orbital angular momentum in one of them goes one way, and in the other one goes the other way. So if I were to put something in those rings, those things should rotate in opposite sense, right? So this is what they did, and this is the result of it. So this looks nice, and again, what can it be used for? But it can be used for, for a lot of colloidal physics, and actually David Greer has done a lot of colloidal physics with it. So you can look at the interaction between colloids, you can look at depending on the distances between them and so on and so forth. And so you can play with, uh, with that sort of physics in a big way. Um, but they stay trapped, and you can see that there is a transfer of orbital angular momentum to them. But what I want you to observe is that they rotate along the ring. Okay? They rotate in the ring. Okay? Because later I will be doing other things. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, we uh, also tried to do a very long time ago, we started with that, and, uh, doing experiments on with gas again use of light and trap. So the first thing that came to mind was, okay, we want to trap particles which are absorptive. So normally, if you remember the model of trapping, uh, absorptive particle, if I come with Gauss, Gaussian beam towards a particle, particle should be pushed out of the beam. Okay? Propelled out of the beam. So in order to trap something uh, absorptive, what we thought, well, we put it into the dark ring, surrounded by light, and that will be the trap. So that's what we did, okay, so I have a dust particle of some sort which is highly absorptive for my light and what I do is I put gauss Lagier beam of light of charge 3 onto it and the particle rotates and then I change the sense of orbital angular momentum to minus 3 which we'll see in a minute and it will rotate in opposite sense. It did it. Well, I was talking too much. So this is rotating one way. Or maybe it's wrong video. Well, believe me, it will rotate that way. <laughs> okay. But I was telling this story to somebody here before. Uh, we, we thought it was a very nice experiment um, uh, to demonstrate transfer of all to one momentum, which has never been shown before. So we sent it for publication maintaining that it was orbital momentum transfer. Uh, and our referees came back and they said, nah, this is propeller effect, this is radiometry effect, this has nothing to do with real orbital angular momentum transfer. Because if it would be, then, then you should be able to have circular polarized light and see what happens when the particle will slow down or speed up with circular polarized light. So let me remind you that Gas like a beam of light can be linearly polarized, it carries orbital angular momentum because it's pointing when <coughs> it's describing this helical way. However, electric field vector is still linearly polarized, right? It's in the light. 
Now I can change that. So here I have um, a linearly polarized light, which has orbital-angular momentum. And the particle is rotating. We have shown that it rotated. Not very fast, but it did rotate with 1.5 hertz. OK, so then instead of sending uh, orbital-angular momentum linearly polarized, I add to it a circularly polarized component. So I circularly polarize my light, which is, cost, which is now uh, being transmitted to my hologram. I put lambda over fault rate on its way, and I circularly polarize it. And so if the circle of polarization is in, in the same sense as orbital angular momentum, it should speed up. If it's in opposite sense, it should slow down if it's really transferred. And this is exactly what I'm doing. So this is, I'm adding one h bar, I'm subtracting one h bar, and it follows. So we, we can do it. Okay, however, of, of course, if I have absorptive particles, I'll have a lot of heating. The other thing which I didn't mention is that uh, I have um, linear momentum, in the, the, the sample will be pressed towards the slide. And I have angular momentum and it will rotate. So we have shown that light carries momentum and angular momentum as well. But uh, we can see that if I want to use it for anything as far as uh, this absorbing particles are concerned, it's a bit difficult because I will heat them. If I want to spin them very fast, I'll heat them and they will just explode. So that won't be very good. Okay, so I do want to rotate things in fields of light, and here is rotation, which I will discuss tomorrow in more details. But what we can see here is very interesting. You cannot see the ring of light, but what is happening is that not only do I trap a particle in the rotator, eventually uh, there are forces which uh, pull, so there are forces acting quite far away from uh, from the center of the beam, or black center of the beam. Uh, and you can see that in principle, we can build rotating crystals. Now, the question is, can I then measure transfer of orbital angular momentum to those structures? Uh, and also, another question could be, what are the forces acting in those things while the transfer is being uh, um, um, the transfer. <coughs> so we want to look at that. And here's just another example. And with that, I think I will finish for today. Uh, so this is, it doesn't want to do it. So what I'm doing here is that I have, as I told you, I can construct any gas layer beams that I want. So this is gas layer of charge 2. This is this in its intensity profile. What I do here, I put it, I put a dumbbell, which I just two glued together spheres, I put it into the beam and they rotate uh, in the beam. And what I will want to do tomorrow is to look at it and see whether I can then uh, quantitatively determine what sort of transfer of water one moment does take place and what does it take. And what are the methods of doing?